Hello and welcome back to one of our Sigma lives. Um, I am Sam and this is my colleague Ed from Sigma and today Hello. we are going to touch upon a few of our top landscaping lenders. Um, so Ed, I believe we're starting off with a, a favourite for a lot of people is the nice 16 millimeter. Yeah, so the 16 millimeter is uh, from our DCDN range, which is for mirrorless crop sensor cameras. Uh, it's been very popular uh, sales-wise, which is always nice. But it's also worth noting it's available for EOS M, so you get Micro Four Thirds, EOS M, Sony E mount, and uh, L mount if you have a crop sensor Leica. Um, really, really popular lens and. Um, well, well, well worth a look. I don't think we've got any sample pictures of this at the moment, have we, Sam? Not on the uh, not on this stream, no. Um, but I can tell you now, it's one of it, it's a very little sharp lens uh, which we offer. And as exactly as you said, because we can offer it in so many mounts, you tend to find this is a lens which people pick up and then they it stays with them as we go throughout. Uh, if they change their camera body, they can change their rear end of the mount and swap it out for an M series or an E series if you wanted to as well. Um, but personally, I, qu I quite enjoy the 16mm. I think it's one of my favorite DCDN lenses um, just because of the sheer size and weight. I mean, if we compare it to, um, I will show you this one later as well, but if we compare it to another landscaping lens, oh, yeah. you can yeah. clearly see the size benefits of going for a nice little 16mm. Well, that's, uh, that was, uh, I think, a 1424 uh, you had there. and. That really shows the difference between a, a crop sensor camera lens and a, and a full frame camera lens. I think uh, one thing about the 16mm that a lot of people don't realise is how good the bokeh is. Because yeah. on those smaller crop sensor lenses, they, they tend not to have so many iris blades. But on the 16mm, it's a nine blade lens. And they're a very pronounced curvature to the blade as well. So you get a lovely rounded iris which does give you a, a better bokeh than you'd normally find on a on a crop sensor lens. And of course, the, the other issue with um, crop sensor lenses and cameras, depth of field controlling it can be tricky. It is a 16mm lens. It is a very wide angle lens, uh, or a very short focal length, perhaps I should say. So that's a limit to how much you can throw the background out. But having that 1.4 aperture, if you are wanting to try and reduce the depth of field, or if you are wanting to take photographs just at dawn and dusk as the sun's setting or rising and the light maybe isn't great, uh, having the 1.4 aperture just makes it a little bit easier to compose your picture, uh, lets a little bit more light onto the sensor. So uh, as a landscape lens, uh, absolute winner. Can't, uh, can't fault it really. I think as well as it is uh, splash proof, isn't it? It's got a, a, a rubber gasket around the, the lens mount to keep Rainwater out of your camera, yeah. so that, that's probably the most the most critical thing. So you see it, see it seals up against the camera throat. So if it is out in the rain, water doesn't ingress through the rim of the mount and and well ruin your camera. So that's a nice little feature. That's pretty much in all of our lenses now across all formats. So that's a nice uh, addition we've added in recent years. Mm. As you say, it's on the majority of the, the global vision going forward, which is. Um, yeah, we've done some fantastic optics. I mean, in this 16mm, as you say, the is is a very nice one for flaring as well. Uh, it's very controlled flare. Um, however, including those nine-bladed apertures, as you say, you do get that nice little rounded flare coming throughout the whole image. So it's, um, yeah, it's a cracking little lens. Um, but I'm just trying to, so we've also got, uh, so this is a 16mm 1.4 uh, DCDN lens. For anyone who is who would like to pick one of these up, and then I believe Ed, what currently price are we looking at for one of these on the market? Is pretty affordable. I I had a sneaky look on Google this morning. Uh, it's for sale from authorised retailers or from the authorised retailer I looked at for three hundred and fifty nine pounds. Great, <laughs> that's that's, that's including good. VAT. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean. I, I remember you go back a few years and uh, a, a short focal length like that would have cost you a month's salary. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's crazy how, how good value it is now. Mm, mm. It's, I'm, I'm still, I've been holding this whilst we've been talking 
And I find when I, when sometimes when I hold lenses, you start to really strain the wrist. But as I said, this, because it is small and light, and the, the majority of the digital crop cameras as well are very small and light. So actually having the combination of both smaller bodies and smaller lenses, you're bound to take this everywhere, really. Um, even we talk about, we're talking about landscapes here, but I've seen some people take some lovely portraiture images using this. It's not the type, but you can kind of get some very street vibes with it as well. So from that yeah. perspective, it is. Mm. Again, if, you, if, you, nice if you've got your subject at the edge of frame, you can throw the aperture open to 1.4. If they're sort of a couple of meters away, you are going to get a, a slightly out of focus background. And when you look at the sort of cameras that's going to be used on, it's the Panasonic GH5, the EOS M Canons, uh, and the little Sony A5000-6000 range. It's just, a, it's just a very nicely balanced lens for all of those, um, even, even the GH5, which is a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So that's a quick roundup of the 16mm. I think the next one we're looking at might be a little bit smaller than this. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's it's a, it's a slightly tighter focal length, though. However, this is pretty new. So this is our 24mm 3.5 DGDN lens. So this is a full frame lens now. So we've gone up from the 16mm, which is crop, gone into this full frame absolutely tiny, tiny footprint of a lens. Um, this is part of our premium compact prime lineup, isn't it, Ed? Yeah. So. yeah. so this this is from our, our new range of four i-series lenses for mirrorless full-frame cameras. Um, and the, the idea being that we, we've gone very much towards the maximum specification, the maximum build quality, the, the maximum aperture, fastest aperture, and so on and so forth. And that's terrific if you're a wedding photographer or you're shooting the next Pirelli calendar, uh, if you're that fortunate. But actually, um, for a lot of people, particularly with the smaller mirrorless cameras, I mean, uh, I don't have a 24 on my sample hasn't turned up yet. But if you look at something like the um, FP uh, or the Sony A7 even, very popular camera. Mm -hmm. If you were to put uh, one of the larger lenses on here, it, it might feel a little bit heavy to be walking around with, especially if you've got two or three primes. But the i-series generally uh, give you a... It is a premium lens, uh, premium quality. We're saying it's equivalent to our art series quality, and, and they're obviously very famous now. Um, but we're just sacrificing a little bit on the aperture, so it's an f3.5 aperture so we can make it that much smaller. Um, but we haven't, it, it's, it's tricky because the construction really feels like an art series lens. It's very much <laughs> yeah. aluminium. It's very much machined and milled. And I don't know if you've got the hood there, but even the lens hoods that come with them. Um, Do somewhere. There we go. Uh, absolutely beautiful. And you can see the, the milling on the, the side of there. When you put that on the lens and you hold it up to your eye, that hood actually is, is super tactile, a uh, really nice thing to use. And if you use it in manual focus, if you remember the old days as I do, when you had the, you know, the old brass helix lenses that were very smooth and had a lot of grease in, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not that, it is a fly-by-wire system, but it's a much more weighted focus system, and it does have an aperture ring if you want to set the aperture yourself. But would you, uh, would you like to tell the good people about the lens cap? I know you're very enamoured of it. <laughs> well, but it's one of my favourite things about these new eye series of lenses and something good. which Sigma have, have done. And I, 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 was, I first asked why has no one ever done this before because it's a great idea. Um, so when you buy one of these eye series lenses, so we do currently three in the eye series range which offer this feature, um, which is you get two caps in the box. You get your normal pick and um, pick and pluck almost cap <laughs> and you get this little one so this is a magnetic cap so it's exactly what it says on the tin it just simply pops on it's so clever and simple and satisfying and, and, <laughs> and, and again if you, if you go back some years you used to get uh, metal lens caps that would screw into the filter thread and they felt very durable and solid and you know, they gave you confidence, but it was a nuisance to have to screw them into the thread. And now with this, with this magnetic cap, uh, it's absolutely lovely. And um, the 
the inside or the, 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 the surface that contacts with the lens, it's flock coated. So there's a flock material on it. So it's uh, slightly lower noise. It doesn't clank into place. And also it uh, doesn't smash anything. So very, very nice thing. If you have a couple of minutes to spare, there's an excellent video made by the factory. Uh, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, I think, where they um, <laughs> they put the lens cap through its paces. If you if you go to the Sigma YouTube channel, you'll find the lens cap video, magnetic lens cap it's video. It's definitely worth a watch. I can tell you now. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. Um, but going back to um, obviously we're talking about landscapes, and this comes into play as well. Although it is a 3.5, we tend to find a lot of landscape shooters will naturally shoot at that higher f-stop anyway. So having a lens which is a compact, um, say, f8 or f16 you want to even push it to, is absolutely remarkable. I mean, I can pop it onto, I've got a Sony here, so I can show you a physical size on an a7. Uh, but we are looking at, oh, this might be, oh, tell a lie, I'll put it on our fp, even better. Even better. So this is the smallest and lightest full frame camera on the market with a very small and light lens. There we go. And again, if we're talking about um, landscape photography, if you're going out, mm. uh, you know, you're setting off at four in the morning to catch the sunset and you've got to walk three miles over hill and down dale, uh, this really gives you the opportunity of having the quality of a full frame camera, whether it's uh, an FP or a Sony um, mm -hmm. A7 or A9, you get the, 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 the full frame quality but with a very compact lens, but still the premium optic. And if you are shooting landscapes, as you rightly say, Sam, you're probably not going to be shooting landscapes at 1.4. You are going to be stopping down to 8 or 11. So uh, starting at 3.5 um, is, isn't such a drawback. And the, the thing that's in my mind, and I'm going to sound old and, and much of an hour out here. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to say it, Sam, I'm sorry. When you think back to the full frame format being the same as 35 millimeter film, 24 by 36 millimeters, mm -hmm. that that was originally created by Oscar Barnick at um, Leica or uh, Lights, um, so that he could take a, a camera mountaineering with him and, and hill walking. So now we sort of it's it's I, and I don't want to take anything away from any other brand. In my mind, it's sort of a spiritual descendant of that ultra portable, okay. tiny little A7 or, or FP camera with a, a compact lens. Um, I don't know why I mention it, but it's not really relevant to the product. Uh, what I will tell you though, is if you were to buy one of those today, it would cost you 479 pounds if you were curious. But I yeah. strongly recommend that you um, give it a try because they are the, the i-series generally um, are, are lovely in use. They're, they're really, really nice lenses. Mm -hmm. So um, this i-series lens falls into the contemporary lineup. So yep. for a lot of people, we have our arts, contemporaries, and sports. Um, so the arts tend to be our high-performing, faster aperture lenses. However, this contemporary is a bit of a funny one. So it kind of sits in the middle of a art and contemporary, I would say. It kind of pushes that boundaries of what a contemporary is as a lens. I believe it's just a named the contemporary series because it's got that slightly slower aperture to yep. it and it's more portable. Um, however, the image performance, I've got an image here for, uh, taken on the 24 mil. There we go. Oh, wow. Uh, and as you can see, it's, I mean, this is on a live, so I don't know how compressed this will look. Um, but looking at the full res here, it is incredibly sharp. And uh, look, at that, that's such a beautiful flare coming in. It's very hard to tell that sort of quality between this and an art series. It's, uh, it's pixel peeping when it comes down to that level. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the two things that I can see, ir irrespective of the resolution on that image, mm -hmm. is how well controlled the flare is uh, oh, yeah. and, and ha how uh, little vignetting there is. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's terrific. Um, is that one of the shots that came uh, from Japan? It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Very nice, very nice. It's very lovely indeed. And as you say, it's controlled uh, flare, controlled vignetting in that size. Um, I, I mean, a lot of people who are looking into these sort of premium compact lenses now, they go, well, I can, in my bag, I normally take around one big lens, or one prime lens, but actually with these, I can fit two of these 
different focal lengths in for the size and the weight of one of those bigger ones. Um, it's nothing against our um, art series and larger lenses there. No, no. They have a different purpose in our market. But for someone who's looking to travel light, these are absolutely incredible for what they are. Well, tra travel light and still have the full frame quality and yeah, the, yeah. the optical performance to match it. Uh, and th th I don't think there are many companies that would be able to produce that quality of lens with, with that uh, quality of finish. Um, uh, you know, at a, at a sensible price point. If you look at other lenses, they, they tend to be tend to be more polycarbonate. If you if you go away from the the, the premium 1.4 fast aperture lenses, they tend to be more more kind of polycarbonate, a little bit bulkier, um, maybe even manual focus. So to get what is essentially a, a full spec lens, if you will, and a premium lens at that uh, in that size and price point is is staggering. Uh, and, and as you rightly say, Sam, the, the only everything about it, to my mind, says art series. Mm. Apart from the uh, the aperture, where we've just sacrificed a little bit of aperture to um, get the size and the weight down a little bit, so it goes into the contemporary range, and that's where the I series sits in the contemporary range. It's it's in the contemporary range very much, uh, for want of a better expression, at the top end was a premium prime line, uh, which I think is terrific. Fantastic. So we uh, moving on to the next one. So we've done the 16 millimeter DCDN. We and then we touched upon the 24 millimeter. Now let's go to across to one I pre briefly showed earlier on, which is a 14 to 24 DGDN. So for a lot of Sigma fanboys out there, you might notice we also have this in a DG version for yeah. Canon and Nikon's. However, the DGDN is. Uh, created for the L and E mount mirrorless systems. So it's a slightly, it was a different design internally. Um, however, it gives you the same focal length with the same aperture. So this is a, oh, there we go, on the FP. <laughs> so this is a 14 to 24, 2.8 throughout the whole range, which is lovely. Um, there's a few uh, extra little features about this lens, which I enjoy for landscape photography. But let's let's pop on to to show you on a, there we go. There it is on an A7. Um, as you can see, it's it's very nicely balanced. It is a very nicely balanced lens in terms of weight and size as well in comparison to an A7 body. Um, we've got some beautiful photos now from um, uh, one of our collaborators, Jack Lodge. So let's have a look. So oh, I believe, wow. <laughs> this is lovely. Uh, I've, I've been down here multiple times and I can tell you with, uh, with my, I can never get an image of this look, looking this good. Um, those, those are beautiful pastel colors. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to talk to him and see what time he goes down and when. <laughs> so, uh, but I, yeah, I think, that, I think that's silly, silly o'clock early, I think, is the answer to that one on a summer's <laughs> day. <laughs> um, but we've also got one which uh, I think one of our colleagues took, which is lovely. But you can see I've just highlighted the corner there as well, because I thought this was really interesting to see. So this is a uh, 2.8 lens. However, in this scenario, we dropped it down to f16 at four seconds. Um, and then let's zoom into that red box in the corner. Boom. And you wow. can see beautifully sharp. Um, and this is, again, we're talking, we're talking about a full frame lens here. Um, a full frame lens in the corner, zooming in. Uh, it's crazy how sharp it still is and how it, it keeps its resolution. Um, I'll show you that one again. So that's the there's the bigger image, the full size. So what, what 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 would you say that was as a percentage of the frame? Is that about ten percent of the frame? Oh, yeah, I would say so. I would say it's about ten yeah. percent. Um, tiny, tiny section, isn't it? Which is yeah, remarkable to crop it on and still. And and it's at the edge. I mean, that's the other thing about mm -hmm. it. All the way out to the edge, it's it's still retaining resolution. Um, at at, at uh, fourteen mil, I take it it's shot at fourteen mil. Looks like it. Um, yeah, that's that's by any standards a terrific lens. And I, I have to I have to confess, it's one of my favourites. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go on holiday in November two thousand and nineteen, which uh, I'm very glad I did. Now, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and, all, all I took with me was uh, an FP uh, 14 to 24 DGDN and the 45 mil from the I series. So, 
Um, it wasn't called the I-Series at that time. That was sort of the precursor to it. And that, that 1424, although it's a, it is a, compared to the 24mm we saw a second ago, or the 45mm, it is a bigger lens. But even on the tiny FB, I think the one you've got there, is that a Sony fit one? It is, it is yeah, the E-mount version. Yeah, yeah. And this is the, the, the L-mount, which is just a slightly shorter uh, flange distance. Um, but that, with that sort of cup in it, it's really nice to walk around with. If you just walk around swinging that with you, um, absolutely very secure, very stable. And to use, the, the grip on it is fantastic. And the controls are lovely as well. Really didn't have any trouble with that at all. And the, the quality of the results, as we just saw, um, even my holiday snaps were pretty good. <laughs> I also shot a uh, little bit of video with it, which was terrific as well. Ah, but Ed, you're very skillful with the camera as well. So <laughs> I wish that were true. <laughs> um, but there is, uh, as I mentioned, on this lens in particular, for you landscape photographers, there is a little hidden feature, which I'd like to show you as well, is if we take the rear cap off, we can see uh, just before we reach the back element, we've actually got uh, three, uh, two little triangles down the bottom and dots and a line at the top. So this is actually a space where we can hold rear filters. Um, so for a lot of landscape photographers, you probably find you would front mount a lot of filters. However, this gives you the added option to remove that a little bit of extra bulk. And if you just wanted it to be safe and secure at the back, you can insert one of these little tiny filters, oh, thank you. pop it in the back. <laughs> it's, it's very cute. <laughs> but yeah, you pop it in the back and then you can... Um, Basically, you can stack more filters on the front if you wanted to. You can in very extreme environments. It just gives you that extra little bit of control, really. Um, but that is such a lovely feature to have on what what is one of our most popular um, landscape lens right now. Is this? So um, there's a, there's a couple of advantages to that filter holder. Of course, if you're if you're shooting landscape stills, you're you're able to uh, get a longer shutter speed, so you can blur water as you saw in that earlier picture, or you can have the clouds blur in the sky. Uh, if you're shooting video or cine, uh, of course being able to pop an ND in the back means you can you can still keep your 180 degree shutter but you can also keep your your iris wider open than, than perhaps it would otherwise be so you can still get some control of depth of field. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, other, the other hidden thing about this lens which uh, probably we don't shout about enough is uh, the 11 iris blades. Mm -hmm. not, not, not 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 but 11. Uh, which is uh, amazing. And you, you mentioned the, the bulbous front element. Invariably, when we do uh, shows, somebody will come up and say, oh, that's a fisheye lens, um, which, of course, it isn't. It's uh, exceptionally well uh, corrected for rectilinear, so vertical lines appear vertical, they don't curve. Um, so a lot of people mistake these for uh, fisheye lenses, but they're not. But it does mean using a front filter is tricky. I know of at least one filter company that's working on a, an adapter to put front filters on. Um, there is an issue with ultra wide angle lenses if you're using uh, a polarizer, um, because light's coming in from such extreme degrees, the, the polarizing uh, plane doesn't always cover the lens evenly, so you can get like an uneven degree of polarization. So it's not always, particularly with ultra wide angles, it's not always such a disadvantage to use rear filters compared to using uh, front mounted filters or what I suppose we should call a focal attachment filters okay. um, but yeah lovely uh, lovely piece of kit and as I say one of my favorites that and the 45 mil that did me for my little holiday in Las Vegas um, ju just before I came home in 2020. <laughs> oh, you were one of the lucky few to get a holiday. Um, I, I, really, I really was. <laughs> I think we've got uh, one more photo actually with the 14 to 24, which I haven't shown yet, which um, actually is a very good one. We touch upon filters and how you can control your shutter speed. Are these oh, yeah. here? Um, so again, it's from Jack, uh, Jack Lodge. Uh, so we're looking at the one on the left. Uh, I, I love that. I love a jungle. Uh, I love it like a woodland. And that just offers so much green. And as you can see, like he's slowed the shutter down as well, uh, probably using some filtered system um, to achieve that nice milky flow of uh, flow of water. And same with the one on the right as well. It looks very still and calm. To, to my eye, the one on the right has the longer exposure time, particularly mm. the, the one. The one on the left is probably 
if I were guessing, I'd say about a second. And when you look at the foliage in the background, the, the breeze isn't moving it around quite so much. Uh, but then when you look at the, the more amber color, the one on the right, it, the, the shutter speed's so long that the, the water as it's moved has become effectively transparent. And I think I'm right in saying the foliage is, is a little bit more blurred in the background. Um, but very nice and nice to see uh, a little bit of foreground interest on that one on the right. Mm. Nice composition. Mm. Very, Sometimes very much, uh, very much a rule of thirds there, being uh, yeah. displayed very nicely. We should, we should perhaps mention. Um, hate to bring up cost when we're looking at artwork like that, and it is mm -hmm. artwork. Um, but again, in the high street today, one thousand two hundred and ninety-nine pounds, which and is as, very affordable for a wide angle. Oh, uh, yeah, for a, for a premium quality full frame. Uh, wide angle lens f2.8 all the way through um, there's really very little to touch it I don't think um, very very affordable um, yeah no, no question and as you're saying there, there is there is a version for DSLR as well worth noting the DSLR version is, is a little bit larger uh, physically it's a little bit bulkier uh, and that's why we do the both because we can leverage the the, the mirrorless um, well, the, the lack of the mirror box essentially gives us a little bit more uh, uh, yeah. room to play with. So well, that's, a lot uh, of people who are um, coming from that DSLR sector and have our lenses already, you can actually use, uh, we do uh, multiple converters and adapters. So we've got our MC11, which is EF to E mount. Um, and if you're going to a Panasonic Leica or Sigma camera, you've got the MC21, which is an EF to L mount system as well. So you can kind of carry your lenses across with you. So although these lenses are, this 14 to 24 has been optimized and has been um, reduced in size as well to kind of uh, marry well with the mirrorless system, you can still um, convert the uh, DG versions made for DSLR across to the mirrorless system as well. So you can kind of yeah. keep, keep those lenses you love. A lot, a lot of lens designs, uh work very well on both DSLR and mirrorless, but some designs um, we can offer a little bit extra, uh, maybe in aperture or in physical size of the product by leveraging the characteristics of the mirrorless camera. Uh, but if you, if you had a, if you had a, a, a 1424 uh, DG and you moved over to an FP or a, an SLT or something like that, um, you would probably buy the MC21 rather than uh, chopping it in for the DGDN version. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we'd like you to do that, but we offer the MC21 <laughs> just to make the just to make the move, or and the MC11 if you want to go to Sony, just to make the move a little bit uh, less painless. Mm -hmm. um, shall we move on to one of our most uh, yes, popular yes, wide yeah. angles for DSLR at the moment? So, yes. uh, what the DG version, which is our 14 millimeter f 1.8. This is a remarkable lens. It's, so, I believe. So, mm. I was, oh, sorry, I was just going to interject with my little pun. Some might say it's out of this world. <laughs> and we'll the, come the, on to that in a second. Indeed. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the fact about, one of the facts about the 14mm 1.8 is it lets twice as much light in than any other 14mm on the market as well. So, which is remarkable. <laughs> and, and in terms of the size as well, we're looking at that and saying it's letting twice as much light as any other 14 mil, and it's nothing too big to carry around at all. Um, but we recently done a lovely uh, a video and a test with this lens in particular and our FP camera, where we actually sent two in space to try and grab the best landscape shot we could find. Um, so I think we've got a couple of the images here. So let's start off with an extreme landscape photo there. <laughs> so, so this is 14 millimeter, as I said, it's 1.8 lens as well. Um, but how's that? So it's remarkable, the, the, isn't it? This was near space from a weather balloon, wasn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, it gets to uh, the edge of atmosphere, then the weather balloon um, it pops, and then it comes slowly down back to Earth. I think that's amazing. I mean, you, you, you want to talk about landscape photography, I mean, that that that's as much landscape as anybody's ever likely to capture, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, definitely. 
I think uh, it's one of the highest full frame cameras you can get on the market. <laughs> uh, here's another one which we took of it. So uh, the nice thing about this project is we, we uh, sent it up early morning. So we managed to get as well, I'll show you one in a minute of like a sunrise and sunset, um, which is beautiful. So we pop on to this now, there we go. Again, just while we have that picture, uh, I'm sorry to talk about uh, the lens rather than these beautiful pictures. Uh, you can see on a 14 millimeter lens how well controlled that lens flare is. That is, uh, and, and how little vignetting again, so little vignetting. That's amazing. Mm, I, I love the flare coming from the sun. You can actually see pretty much all the lovely rays, can't you? Absolutely, absolutely. That's, um, but this was such an exciting project for us um, because it's it's, an it's such an exciting lens, and we thought, well, what's the biggest landscape we could take? Um, as quite rightly said, this is this is one of the the best things we could have taken with this lens in particular. Um, I I actually checked the serial numbers on the lenses and the FP cameras we use for that um, oh, yeah. on our stock system because I was hoping I might be able to buy one and have you know. An FP that went into space, or 14 that went into space, <laughs> yeah. but sad, sadly they were they were not available to me. Uh, oh no! Uh, <laughs> been spoken for. Um, it for a lot more. <laughs> it actually, I think I'm right in saying that the 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 company we used for the weather balloon they um, they chose to keep some of those products, didn't they? The, the, they did, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they've um, I, I believe we sent them a, a few of these items I have said 14 to 24 in the FP because they are looking for the highest performance in such a small compact size with a, with a really wide angle so it, it's it's a very niche market for them but actually for a lot of our products which we offer uh, the 14 mil uh, 1.8 and the FP fit the bill perfectly for them um, mm, absolutely you, you touched on a point earlier which I think is often overlooked when you said that at 1.8 you're getting twice the light of any other 14 mil. Um, this is the only 1.8 14 millimeter lens on the market, certainly for full frame. Uh, and we, we, we very glibly talk about oh, it's, it's one stop, uh, but we overlook the fact that one stop is actually doubling or halving the amount of light, uh, depending whether you're going up or down the scale. So yeah, one, one stop is twice the light. Um, which is uh, worth bearing in mind, I think. And I, I think it was a, a wise of you to make the point. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, so I think as well, this comes in at a very good price as, um, in the market as well, doesn't it? What are we what are we looking for our fourteen millimeter currently? Um, it, 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 <laughs> I, I'm almost asked to tempt you to guess, but I, I know you already know the answer because I think <laughs> most, most people most people will be thinking two, three thousand. It's actually one thousand three hundred and forty-nine. Um, so you're getting the world's only one point eight. Well, uh, eight, uh, yeah, try again. You're getting the world's only f one point eight lens um, for you know thirteen. 13, 1400 pounds, it's it's staggering. Um, worth pointing out, it's available, it's a DG lens, so you can have it for Canon, uh, I think I'm right saying Canon DSLR, is that Canon and Nikon? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sony E mount, uh, L mount. Uh, I've actually got it written down in front of which is why I keep looking down. I've, I haven't written Canon, I've written EF. So yeah, so Canon, Canon, Nikon, Sony E and L mount. So you can pop that on your uh, S18 or your SL2 if you wanted to, or it'll be quite happy on um, AOS 5R. Not and a problem as we at all. mentioned earlier, with um, I think it was the 16 mil. The nice thing about a lot of the lenses we offer in our range is, if you pick that 14 mil up in EF, and you then convert all of your kit to Sony down the line, and you want to keep that 14 mil as signal, we actually offer a mount conversion service, so you can come into our service center. Mm -hmm. Um, and we will basically be able to convert that to any of the mounts which it's available in for you, um, yeah. which is a great service to do because I mean if you if you take this as as Ed rightly said like if, if he picked up that one which went to space and he wanted to keep that, however he wanted to move over to a Sony and he wanted that one where you could see it was a little bit of a comet hitting the side of his lens or something and he scratched it and he wanted to keep it then uh, we can still uh, keep your memories on your lens but change the rear end of it as well. Yeah, the, the mount, the mount conser conversion service is, is um, I think I'm right in saying, unique to Sigma. 
Um, and the, the lenses are a lifetime investment. You might, you might change from Canon to Nikon or Sony. Um, but uh, the, the lenses, where you can, you, you would want to keep them. And being able to send them to us and, and swap them over. But there are some provisos. You can only swap from one mount to another mount that we originally offered the lens in. So, for example, on the 14 mil, we do uh, E mount, L mount, SA, which is Sigma, EF, and Nikon F. You couldn't therefore swap it to Nikon Z because we never offered it in a Nikon Z fitting. Uh, just worth bearing that in mind. But yeah, the, the mount conversion surface and, and, and to a degree the USB dock, which was unique when it came out, there's a few um, similar products available now, uh, just, just shows the, the cutting edge. I think the 14 mil. Uh, there's two things about it. It's the absolute antithesis of the uh, of the um, making the the best product possible, the least vignetting, the least coma, the least um, pin cushioning, the highest resolution. And then when you look at the I series, that's the reaction to it. So if you want to have that spec at all that costs, uh, then we do the 14.1.8, the 105.1.4. I'll just mention as well. And then if you want something that's a little bit more, or indeed a lot more portable and, and easy to carry around, we do the I-Series now as well. But that 14 mil um, was designed by a guy who was very keen on astrophotography, uh, one of our designers in, in Tokyo and Japan. And uh, he, he, he more or less designed it for his own, uh, <laughs> his, his own specification, let's say. So if you were interested in astrophotography, as well as uh, landscapes, uh, it's a very good choice indeed, uh, particularly when you mm -hmm. look at the coma in, in the corners. He also designed the 105 1.4, which again okay. was, was largely for, uh, I believe it uh, uses it for deep sky uh, astrophotography. Mm -hmm. So but those two lenses in particular will be the, the ones for astro shooters, won't they? I, I don't want to say they're astro lenses. Um, <laughs> okay. they, they are general purpose lenses, absolutely. Uh, excellent for, for everything they do, but they were designed by a guy who's very keen on astro photography, <laughs> and it was his his own little personal project. Let's say <laughs> it's nice be, be, being a family-owned company. Um, it's nice that our designers are free to come up with these ideas, and, and some of them do make it into production. Um, it's, it's not always the case. So. Um... The, the nice thing about the um, we've also we've been talking about a lot of wide angle lenses, um, and we've shown 14 mils to 14 to 24 mils, 20 24 mils and 16 mils. Um, now I'd like to put another one in the mix. Um, however, this is proving to be very popular for a lot of uh, uh, landscape shooters. Is a 100 to 400. So. A lot of people go a 100 400 for shooting landscapes. <laughs> um, however, it's for isolation, so it's to zoom in on certain subjects which you want. You know, it's not always about getting the widest field of view. Um, as we can clearly uh, see in this lovely shot here. Uh, so this is on a 100 400. Yeah. Again, a landscape. Um, and this is what a lot of people would see as a telephoto lens. But actually, it's, if you didn't have that tighter field of view, you wouldn't be able to get that same look that we've that uh, Jack again has offered in this image. Absolutely remarkable, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to guess that that was shot at the 100 mil end, mm -hmm. and I think it's a, a lovely example of the the natural um, sort of compression in the image. So if you, if you get uh, to the 400 mil end, everything looks a little bit. Uh, squashed uh, perspective wise mm -hmm. but at the 100 mil lens also a great portrait lens of course um, yes. although the, the aperture uh, not not ideal but uh, it's a good focal length but yeah very natural uh, perspective mm -hmm. very very nice picture he does he does like his uh, his misty scenes doesn't he <laughs> <laughs> yeah he might take a, a fog machine with him everywhere he goes we don't know <laughs> <laughs> Not, not, I think not it's a, just not getting a nice product. Yeah, <laughs> um, but we've also got one which uh, I think one of our colleagues took when he went to Cambridge with the 100-400. And this is, is uh, a landscape shot. However, it's not the traditional. It's more, to, it's more in this case to show the versatility of the lens as well and to show how far we can actually zoom in on it. So this is in uh, 100 mil uh, at f5. 
and that's a it's a, it looks like a cathedral to me and then we go and we pump in mm. uh, so this is taken same sort of angle uh, let me give you that perspective again so uh, zooming back out to 100 mil so we look at the top of the cathedral there where all the pi uh, uh, pillars are we can see we've got the, the banding of the uh, of the top there which is this bit as we zoom in um, so you can see straight away how much you can actually isolate with this lens and, and just grab perfect little shots of... You can, you can see every chisel mark in the stonework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely incredible, isn't it? It, it really um, is. And for, for landscapes, having a, a, a telephoto lens, if you have got a, a misty morn and you're looking at a... a, a field of farmland and there's a mm -hmm. farmhouse or a tractor in the corner of a field it's nice to photograph the whole field but it's also nice to pick out those uh, details in the distance that the tractor going about its business or the the farm farmyard in, in the in the mist the farmhouse in the mist so it does it does lend itself very versatile uh, plus of course you know you can use it for the things you'd normally use a telephoto lens for Mm -hmm. and this, nice. this lens is very similar to the 14 to 24 we were talking about earlier. So this one in particular has been designed for an, uh, a mirrorless system. So it's mm -hmm. slightly smaller and slightly lighter. However, we also do it in the original DSLR DG version. So yep. if you wanted a Canon or Nikon version, you could still pick up our current range. However, we also do uh, two. So this is the DG DN, and then we do an additional DG version. Um, but I believe, as oh, sorry, Ed, I was going to say, I believe we um, you can actually extend it slightly further than the hundred, uh, than the four hundred, can't you? Mm, absolutely, yes. Uh, I, was, I was just going to pick up on that point: the difference between the the DG and the DGDN. Um, so it's another lens where uh, it, there there is an advantage, not on every design, but there's an advantage on this design in making a a mirrorless specific one because we can leverage the um, characteristics of the mirrorless cameras, but it actually has an, an additional SLD lens element in compared to the DSLR one. Now that doesn't mean the DSLR one is missing anything, it just means it doesn't need it. But with the DGDN version, the lens itself is physically a little bit smaller, so adding that little optical element um, just allows us to make it that little bit smaller and, and optimize it for mirrorless. So here's my 100 400 here's my uh very nice is it much smaller than the the, the dslr ones or oh, a little bit small perhaps i should say this is a That's tc funny. 1411 and these do marry up nice thing about this teleconverter and the two times teleconverter on the on the l mount on the fb at any rate is you also retain autofocus um so now I've gone from a 100 to 400 to a 200 to 800 mil lens. Wow. And of course, the, the, the lens itself does have a, a very effective optical stabilizer. So that, that loss of aperture isn't um, as much of a handicap as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. But uh, to get to get to an 800 mil lens for uh, essentially less than a thousand pounds uh, with autofocus, with fantastic optical quality, um, and handheld by the looks of it. I mean, that's, that's yeah. with the hood on you've got as well. That's, that's the hood, which is uh, very nice. It's got this little um, contoured facet to it. So when you're actually using the lens, it gives you somewhere to hold it, which is quite nice. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can also push full to zoom. You, you can obviously twist the zoom as well, but all lenses do both. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice feature. Uh, and yeah, just, just very practical. It's got quite a lot of functionalities on the side of it, hasn't it? So looking down here, um, well, yeah, exactly that. We, so we've got an AF switch on and off, so you can go to a manual to um, autofocus straight away. We have a focus limiter, so you can actually tell the lens roughly where you're going to be focusing, and it will adjust it faster than going through the whole range of the focal length. Um, we've got a customizable AFL button. So this is great, especially if you're using um, one of the newer series with the Sony or, or the um, L-mount series. You can actually change it in camera, and you can adapt that to be hundreds of many different options. <laughs> but having it on the lens, is it's perfectly actually where your finger sits as well. So um, if we come back to it, if I'm holding the lens, it actually 
it's it's the perfect <laughs> perfect fun for me. Um, but and then going on to the two modes of stabilization as well. Yeah, so so mode mode one is uh, effectively universal donor. Uh, if you're hand holding the lens, you would go for mode one. Uh, it's not really relevant for um, landscape photography necessarily, but if you're a tracking game, if you're following a, a bird in flight or an aircraft in flight, uh, and you're mm -hmm. panning, you would use the mode two because as you pan that way, you don't want the OS trying to stabilize it going the other way so option yeah. two is, is for panning shots mostly for sports and wildlife uh, option mm -hmm. one is universal donor when you're just hand holding in terms of using it on a tripod incidentally um because it is a little bit smaller and lighter than the dg version and um, because we wanted to make it as light a weight as possible it doesn't have a tripod collar as standard it has a, this little cosmetic ring which i'm just about prize away there, oh, there we go. which which reveals mounting points for uh, a TS-111 tripod shoe. So if you wanted to mount a tripod collar there, you can, uh, but it's a relatively light lens, so if you wanted to mount the tripod on your camera, that wouldn't be a problem either. But really, most people, because of the quality of the OS, they're going to be hand-holding it anyway. Uh, maybe not for, for, for landscapes, which is what we're nominally talking about here, of course. Uh, but then again, saying that, it's a great wildlife lens. I get, we've got some photos here of some of the wildlife functionality. So this is at 400mm. Um, um, and if we want to have a look at a little bit of sharpness here, so we can punch wow. in on that 400mm. There we go. And you can see straight on that eye, it's so sharp as a lens. The, the eye is sharp, but I'm just also looking at the feathers to the left of the, mm. the, the bill. Um, the detail is is outstanding, really. Mm. Wow. Seeing these photos, it, it, it always inspires me to go out and shoot more. <laughs> and I, I might do it this afternoon, you know? <laughs> well, you never know. I've, I've actually been filming the garden birds with the 100 to 400. Oh, yeah. I've been yeah. uh, when, I, when I've uh, stocked up the bird feeders, I've set the 100 400 up uh, just on the tripod uh, with the FP, mm. and uh, I've left them to it. So I get about an hour's uh, worth of recording at 4K, and nice. of which there's about oh, two minutes that I have to then chop out uh, to later <laughs> date. Uh, but it, you know, it's not like I've got anywhere else to go at the moment, so no, that's um, thing. yeah, it's nice to. To be able to use it at all, but yeah, the, some of the, some of these photographs that uh, the contributors uh, allow us to use are are mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think should, should we talk the, the about nice... the price? Yeah, yeah. six hundred and ninety-nine. Did you say? S uh, no, six hundred and seventy is is the price oh. in the street, um, and, and that's from an authorised Sigma seller, so you'll you'll get your full three-year UK warranty. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, less than well under seven hundred pounds. For a you know four hundred mm lens um, with optical stabilizer, uh, yeah, re really fantastic. Uh, it's remarkable. Great lens. Fantastic. So let's just uh, recap some of the, the the five top lenses that we we've discussed today. So the first one we looked at was our lovely sixteen millimeter. So this is the one of the smallest and lightest um, in terms of our wide angle collection we've picked for today. Uh, it comes in at a 1.4 aperture as well. And this is purely for the digital crop series of cameras. However, it offers so many mounts out there. So we can we can convert it to micro four thirds. We have EFM. We have uh, Sony E and L mount as well. So you have such a variety for such a lovely little lens. Um, and then the next one we discussed was an even smaller package, which was our 24mm. Uh, so this comes in at our i-series, so it's our premium compact prime lenses. Uh, this i-series is a 3.5 aperture, but as we said, a lot of landscape photographers will probably drop that down anyway. But um, it's such an incredibly small size, so you can fit two of these in the bag in comparison to one larger lens. Um, at a fraction of the weight as well. Um, here it is on the A7. Um, and then the next one we discussed was one of the most popular ones we've seen so far for, for the landscape, which is the 14 to 24 uh, 2.8 GGDN. So now we've gone back to the full frame uh, mirrorless system. However, we do offer this in a DSLR version as well. Um, and after that, we moved across to the 14 mil let me grab a nice photo of the 14 mil 
there it is, 14 millimeter 1.8. So this is the, the widest and brightest 14 millimeter on the market currently. Um, it's designed by an astrophotographer. It's remarkably, remarkably sharp. Um, I'm going to quickly just chuck this back in there as well about our space space mission. You can actually look this up on our YouTube channel where we did a, a short challenge and documentary style uh, project to go alongside with this where um, Tim and myself uh, raced each other to try and get the best shots and retrieve the balloons uh, when, the, when the cameras landed. Um, but you just go to our YouTube channel at Sigma UK and you'll find it on there. And then... Um, the last one we, we spoke about was the 100 to 400 as well. So this is, was more to isolate subjects um, and to grab a, a slightly more tighter, uh, to get a tighter, a tighter focal length on any landscape work, really. Um, fantastic. So um, I think that's pretty much it for the, the landscape lenses, which we, uh, we will currently recommend. But thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Ed, thank you for your time as well. Thank, thank you, Sam. Uh, yep, five, five landscape lenses there to, to consider. Um, and we do hope that you will. Uh, and thank you for watching. We do appreciate it. Thank you, guys. See you again.